Right, I'm here for another episode of Reflections, and this one is going to be with Reginald, former mid laner of Team Solar Mid, TSM, the team he also owns, and he's now the owner. So whenever I interview really old school players, I always actually am very interested, because there's not that much information out there on this, on the years before League of Legends was a big esport. So for me, it became like a premier esport in sort of like season two. You know, I remember they had all the IEMs. It was, you know, obviously you had the big proper world championship then, not just like the smaller one for season one. And, you know, for me, it started to get big then. Well, people might not know this, but if that's 2012, people could be playing League of Legends from 2009 when there was no circuit. And you know, that's why I always joke that. It, if you talk about world championships, the reason why like season one doesn't count as much to me is the same reason why like the world cyber games at CLG one where there was like four teams there doesn't really count, you know, because, you know, this, this is a much smaller scene. So you were one of the people, right, who was playing pretty much from day one almost, right? Yeah, so I was one of the very first hundred players to ever play League of Legends and I got into like friends and family alpha. And um, at that point, I thought the game was like, pretty bad to be honest and so I actually I actually quit the game because I, I came from Dota and um, there wasn't a lock screen but I, I found like I played League with lock screen I didn't know that, that, I, that I could un unlock the screens so I quit okay. for a while and I came back <laughs> okay so in those early days the funny thing is that before it got to be in a big eSport, it was actually a lot of the people from around then who actually became the first top players, like not just in NA, people might not know this, but before the, long before there was Korean servers, people like Insec, MacNoon, they're all playing on the NA server, right? You kind of did know all these people early on, right? Yeah, it was just every, every single player from every region played on North America, and we all had like a Ventrilla at that time, where we all socialized with the Koreans and the Europeans, and it was honestly really fun. It was a really closed, tight-knit community, and I, like all the top players knew everyone. So I remember, I think it was in LCS one season that they actually did a feature which touched on what I'm about to talk about now, which a lot of people to this day don't know this, Reginald, that part of your rivalry with Hotshot came from the fact you were in a team that basically became CLG, right? And then you left this team, and that didn't that in some way spark the reason why it was called Team Solo Mid or something, something along these lines? Am I getting the story vaguely right? I mean, the, the history is um, so long, right? And it goes way, way, way beyond that and before that. But um, essentially what, what happened at that time was that um, there was a clan named CLG, and, it, and uh, CLG was actually originally founded by Hotshot, and the website was uh, created by my brother with him. And at that time, uh, Hotshot was like one of the the worst players, or not one of the worst players, but one of the the players that were not as good on in in the CLG clan. It was like Big Fat G or Big Fat GG or Big Fat LP. There was yes. like Kobe. There was uh, me. There was Dan. There was like um, I forgot what his name is. This is Chouster, a Korean. Maybe? No, there was Chouster, and there's a there's a Korean dude. I forgot his name though. Uh, but anyways, they they actually Lilac, wanted to maybe. No, 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 no. no uh, he's like okay. super old school. There's like right, louching okay. and stuff. And everyone thought Hotshot was bad, but he was popular. So they wanted to kick him from the starting roster and just have him be a mascot. But because he was popular, we just decided to let him on. And <laughs> right. at that time for CLG, right? Because uh, it was so early on that no one really thought esports was going to blow up. So no one really cared who the owner was. And for me, we were just in it there for fun. So, um, you know, we just played in a clan together named CLG and um, we would take turns starting and when like there were serious matches we would just put the five best players and the reason why I left CLG was because uh, it was for business relations um, back then on own 3d um, there was like two rival streaming networks right there was CLG yes. and there was TSM streaming network and hotshot started to like poach my uh, my uh, my TSM streamers even when I was playing on CLG and he wasn't necessarily the owner of CLG at that time he just owned the CLG streaming network but the CLG okay. esports team he was yeah. just like a bench warmer and what ended up happening was I got so pissed off that he started like poaching our streamers. I just like left the team and I was like, I'm going to create my own team and shit on you. Um, and so that's, that's basically what happened. But like, it was so old school and I was so immature and you, you know, at that time, I'm like, even, even the way I'm telling the story, right? I'm not even telling it from Hotshot's perspective. Sure. So, uh, it's biased. So like from his perspective, I probably did something dumb to, you know, it's like, like it's, it's just all old stuff. So whatever. Okay. So what was it true that I mean you said there like the thing about the streaming network thing was it was it true that the reason you made it called Team Solo Mid though was so, like I heard some legend that you know it was that you really were like it's my team and I'm the mid so it's going to be all based around me was it was it as extreme as that what was the reason for coming up with the name Yeah so 
the reason why I made TSM was because I just wanted to shit on CLG. So that was the reason why. Okay. The reason why... You did a good the, job over history, I guess. <laughs> I, I, you're right, I did. My one goal, I'm a really focused person. So every single time I focus on something, I do a good job at it. But the reason why it's named Team Solo Mid was because um, our website was named solomid.net. And so it was just naturally really easy to name the team Team Solo Mid. I didn't really put that much thought into it because I was like 18. And in retrospect, it's a pretty dumb name if you think about it, right? Like, yeah. why would you put team in a team name? If you're yes. already a team, <laughs> it's redundant to call it Team Solo Mid. So in theory, I should have just called it Solo Mid. But at the end of the day, it all worked out because TSM chants are amazing and it, so it sounds great. TSM sounds great. So I really lucked out with that. But we're practically, we're, we're focused on rebranding to just purely TSM because we're more than just a MOBA uh, team. Yes. Um, but yeah, we really lucked out with that. The website was named solomid.net was because I played middle. Uh, and um, I played middle every single game uh, for my most of my career. So I just named it solomid.net. And that's where I created most of my guides on. Okay, so so in line with this point that you were on CLG, in the early days when the TSM first had a team, a lot of people might not know this, Reginald was not in the starting lineup. It was actually people like St. Vicious, Odd One. There's, there's a bunch of different players, right? So when when did you decide, like, I'm going to be playing for TSM and we're going to actually become a proper team, like a serious team, not just kind of a fun clan like you were saying? Well, TSM was actually already created before CLG, and I, and I kind of tell the narrative that I created TSM to crash shit on CLG, but what actually is the truth is that I own TSM, but I played on CLG. And so I left CLG because I, I was one of the better players on CLG. I, I, let's be honest here, I felt like I was the best at that time. Okay. And I was rank one. And um, I left CLG to join TSM to, to own CLG. And Saint was was so excited that a spot on CLG opened up. He left TSM to join CLG. And guess what happened, Saint? You got owned, bro. <laughs> but anyways, okay. uh, uh, yeah. So I was on CLG. It was it was it, it didn't matter because a conflict of interest at that time didn't matter because we were playing for nothing. You know, we were yes. just playing for pride. So I owned TSM. I was playing on CLG. It's super confusing, I know. Uh, and CLG wasn't owned by Hotshot at that time. It was just a clan owned by friends. And I was the sole owner of TSM. So that's how it worked out. Right. I saw a Reddit comment recently, right? It wasn't from anyone famous. I, I don't know you'd even know the person. And it could all be made up, right? So you can tell me if it is. But there was a guy where it was in some thread about TSM and, and someone mentioned you. And someone said something like, oh, I actually came from where Reginald was from, like in the early days. And I remember him, you know, and actually he was super into gaming. But, you know, all the people around him were sort of like, oh, that'll never go anywhere. You know, like kind of like made fun of him for it or whatever. Is there anything to this? Did, were you kind of like a driven person in the early days? Um, yeah, so a lot of people actually don't follow my history, but I was really driven. But it wasn't due to like having strong business acumen, but I was just really passionate about esports, right? So if you think about it from like a League of Legends perspective, I I threw some of the I threw practically all like the very first early tournaments. So even in closed beta, I was throwing tournaments for free. I was contacting sponsors for sponsored gear. I was contacting Riot for Riot points. I was always trying to put together tournaments because there were no tournaments and I and I like to compete so much. I would create my own tournaments and then play in the tournaments. And that sounds really lame, but you know when there were no, like when there was there were just no events at all to play in, um, you either create them create them yourself and compete in them, or you just don't do anything, right? So yes. I threw a lot of weekly tournaments. I played in all the go for laws back then, and you'd have to compete for like eight nine hours just for a hundred dollars and split between like five people. So you'd make twenty dollars in like ten hours. But it wasn't for the money. It was it was for it was it was for fun, and I really enjoyed it. And so I threw a lot of tournaments for the first year and a half. Uh, we did the TSM Solomon Invitationals. It was some of the biggest prizing tournaments and highest viewership online um, tournaments at that time. We, I think we peaked at like 90,000 viewers. And then once Rise started the LCS, we were no longer allowed to uh, throw our own series. But it was really successful at that time. Um, you know, Solomon Invitationals was one of TSM's biggest revenue drivers uh, way back in the day. Okay. So as you said, like, you know, obviously CLG was established and you made, you came over to TSM, but a lot of people bearing in mind the history in the LCS, where obviously for most of it, TSM has been on top and especially has been doing better than CLG. A lot of people also may not know that in the early days of competitive play, CLG was actually the better team. They had the better placings on the first lands in season one and at the pre-season pre two tournaments, the IEMs, etc. So what was this period of time like where you were trying to get TSM to the top, but they weren't actually the best team yet? 
Yeah, so it, it honestly was pretty challenging, right? And at that time, I I took the complete wrong approach. I was pretty stupid about it because I was a better leader than Hotshot and more convincing and a better player. What I should have done was I should have convinced like Big Fat GG and Chowster and all those players to join me and leave Hotshot. But I was so arrogant and so egotistical and cocky that I was like, fuck you all. I'm going to leave and I'm going to beat you all. But realistically, if I was smart and I knew what I was doing and I understood, um, if I understood, like, if I had any remote social skills at all at that time, I, what I would have done was I would have grabbed those players to go with me, right? Because yeah. Hotshot um, was just a bad leader and he didn't really work hard and put any effort in at all. And so I could have easily done that. But what I did was I took like the really hard approach with the weights on and I left the team and I built a team from scratch with like players that are good, but they weren't as good as Chaucer and Gigi at that time. Yes. Gigi was arguably one of the best players. Um, and, you know, he was really good. He played a lot. He was amazing. Chaucer back in the day too. Everyone only remembers remembers him for the summer alt in LCS, yes. which is like really sad because his career is a lot longer. But he was also really good and naturally talented at the game. And he just uh, lost focus. That's why he became bad. But he was really good too. Sure. So, I, so I, I honestly think that uh, that approach would have been much, much, much better. But the only reason why we were able to take overtake CLG was because I worked a lot harder, and the team that we put around put together, we were a lot more focused. We put we practiced for a lot more hours, versus for CLG, right? They were going to school, they were doing it part time, they would put in a fourth of the time we did. But well, I think in terms of like just pure player talent, they were definitely like they definitely had better players. We we were able to surpass them because we put in more effort. Okay, so in the early days in season one was when Loco Doco was in NA and he was playing with Team Solo Mid. And he actually told me this story once that he even wanted to play for you at the season one championship. But basically someone at Riot was like, no, like, you know, like you're not in NA anymore. And plus, like, if you wait, you know, we're going to have these, like, there's going to be like World Cyber Games for Korea and stuff. We're going to have a Korean server. So he didn't, right? Obviously, Loco Doco has been another big name in League of Legends. He's been through a lot of transformation. Who was, what was young Loco Doco like when you first met him coming over from Korea? What was that guy like? <laughs> Honestly, at that time, I think everyone, we were just little kids. We were 18. We didn't know what we were doing. We, 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 like, we were all so immature. I was so immature. Loco was really immature. Like, if I, like, if I was a five in terms of immaturity, Loco would be like a one or two. And uh, his mind was just all over the place. He never really what, knew what he wanted, but he just wanted to have fun. And he was really passionate about esports. Um, I don't. I don't know. He was really pleasant to talk to and and, and hang out with, but uh, for the most part, he was never like one of the super godly players consistently. But there were there were like certain patches where he'd be really good and and like pop off. That that's what I remember of Loco. But like it's been so long ago, it's hard for me okay. to. It's 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 hard for me to remember. So one of the key moments uh, for TSM was when you managed to get in Dyrus to come join the team. And the storyline of that is quite a, is one that I, I never really heard you address it since then. And so there's lots of legends have built up about it because people might remember, obviously the Rain Man was the top laner at the time. And since TSM was also a team that streamed a lot, he was, he had his own popularity and his own following, you know, and what people remember is like two parts to the story. One is that like, you know, supposedly there was this argument and he thought it wasn't worth scrimming or something and he wanted to stream. And then people think as a result, he was just kicked. And then the Dyrus part is that Dyrus already lived in the house. He'd obviously been on Epic Gamer, your brother's team. And then you just brought Dyrus into play. Is is that actually, what, is there any extra details we need to know about that story? Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you the story for context so you understand. Sure. But um. But it, it's it's basically that. What ended up happening was we went to game uh, we went to Gamescom, right? And it was a tournament that we lost to CLG. We took second, and that was also the week that Riot announced their five million dollar circuit for season two. So our whole entire team, we were super hyped about it, and um, and we we lost that tournament, and we decided to move into a gaming house, right? And uh, we went to like a various tournaments, and we we started to take we kept taking second, third, or fourth, and we weren't happy. Uh, and we all wanted to scrim more, and Rainman wanted to play more solo queue, and it just absolutely didn't make sense from a, like a team perspective, because all the other four players felt like we like if we wanted to be better as a team, we should be practicing as a team, not playing solo queue. And uh, Rainman thought he was like the absolute best top laner, so he kind of like tested us. He's like, okay, how about you try playing a tournament without me to see how it goes. 
And so we, we went to approach like crumbs. We asked him to join our team and he didn't really want to take esports full time. And so Dyrus just happened to be in our house and he happened to be living there. And he was also really, a really good player. And so we're like, Hey, look, a spot opened up on TSM. Do you want to, do you want to play? Uh, do you want to like try out for it and play in a couple tournaments with us? See how it goes. And w- when Dyrus joined, we, we started to win uh, like a bunch of events. We became a lot better. And so we decided to stick with them. We went to, I think it was like, we went, I forgot what tournament we went to, but we went to uh, a tournament with Dyers. We took first with it. And uh, as, this, the, as soon as we went back to the team house, Rain Man had already moved out. He didn't even tell us that he moved out. Uh, I forgot which tournament that, I think it was an IPL that we yeah, won. It was IPL, IPL 4. Yeah. yeah, it was an IPL 4 that we, we went to. And that was a tournament that we we're like really testing Dyers to see like if he was going to get the like full starting position or not. And when we won it, and we got by the time we got back to the house, Rain Man had already moved to Florida without telling us. So it was like, uh, it was it was like pretty shocking. But he knew that he would he had already lost his job because it was kind of like, hey, see how you guys do without me. Watch, you guys are going to regret the decision. And then we won. And so uh, he he knew that like he was just going to be you know uh, a streamer or have, or have to move to another team at that point. And so he just made the decision himself and left. <laughs> Okay. Right. Again, actually, in the context you did before when you did for Chowster and, and GG, sadly, a lot of fans come into esports every year, and so they didn't see all the years before. So they're only going to remember Dyrus from the very end, and they're going to think, right, someone who could only sort of had to play tanks all day and was having, he was always the guy who looked like he got the least resources, you know. Season two Dyrus was pretty different, right? What was he like when he first joined your team? Well, Dyrus was an amazing mechanical player, right? And um, he he was really he was really good. Like so, um, way back in the day when I used to play, the game would all be about um, just like how how good how good your mechanics are, how good you are individually. Primarily because no one really worked on teamwork, team communication. And as the the like as the ceiling, um, there's like a mechanical ceiling to pretty much every single game, right? Sure. So once once most players are able to hit that cap, what ends up happening is that every player practically is almost the same, and the difference between your mechanical skills maybe like two to three percent. So what ends up actually separating you from pretty much the rest of the players is your communication. And from a communication standpoint, there's practically like. I mean, I'm not going to say there's no cap to it, but there's a much bigger barrier to actually improve. Do, do you kind of get what I'm saying? Like yeah. The ceiling is much higher, right? You can communicate more concise. You can look out for a bunch more things. You can notice things faster. You can make really like sharp calls that are like critical to the game that can win or lose the game, like a base race, a, a rotation, um, like a back timer, a ward. Uh, and all those small things add up to make, to, make, like, to make you like an absolute beast player. And like from a mechanical perspective, if you play the game a lot, hitting the mechanical ceiling honestly should be pretty easy if you just play all day. So um, like for Dyrus, he was really good from a mechanical perspective. And as time went on, from like a me- communication perspective, he he wasn't super strong. Um, he wasn't super strong because he was really good for being a mechanical player. And all of a sudden, like you know, through the time span of like five years now. To be a really good player, you have to like be really good at communication. And so, for like players that weren't as strong in terms of communication standpoint, they kind of fell off. But uh, Dyrus was really good back then. Like he was a top, like top, top player in the West. And you know, it kind of sucks that people don't uh, remember that. Yes. So also, the other thing I want to ask about was when you said that you'd moved into the team house. One thing that I actually remember at the time that I thought was very admirable about that was. You wanted to be a team house, not just to be together, but also you actually moved over to the East Coast to be able to play Europeans, right? And to get, be able to scrim better competition. Yeah. So at that time, right, I was really fortunate because I created uh, the websites for TS, TSM. And so from like being an 18 year old, I was able to make enough money to just fund my like my passion, my hobby uh, without having with like, I mean, it was a lot of money. It was most of the money that I made. But, you know, most people that are that age aren't able to just pursue something that they're really passionate about with like um, with ability to pay for it. And at that time, I didn't really think esports was going to be a business at all. I just did it because I loved to compete. I loved to uh, I loved esports. And um, yeah, we just moved to the East Coast because I wanted to do whatever it took to win, even if it meant like moving, you know, across uh, cu- country without knowing like where I was going. So like that was the first time ever going to New York. After going back from Gamescom for two weeks, I packed all my stuff and um, I, I moved to New York without ever being in New York at all. So it was like an amazing, crazy experience. I like thinking back. I thought I think I'm crazy for doing that, honestly. 
Okay. Right, since as I, I'd set it up already that you knew some of these Korean players before they got the Korean server, you knew who Mac Noon was and who some of these guys were. And in fact, some of them even, funnily enough, like I said, were lie, like even like played in CLG, et cetera, you know? So there were connections already, right? Were you one of the people, kind of like Chowster and Doublelift, who thought to yourself, like the Koreans won't get better than us? Because you know, some of them who didn't hadn't followed StarCraft or whatever, they thought actually like, no, we'll always be better than Koreans. I think the famous line from Doublelift was, Koreans will always be one year behind or something. You know, it all sounds hilarious now, but in context, it wasn't as crazy as it sounds now. What did you think when Koreans got involved in the game? Well, I mean, you have to think about it, right? Uh, we were really young and we didn't really understand as much. And I, I personally thought that Koreans were not going to ever be able to catch up because we were just so far ahead, right? And I didn't really uh, understand the game at the level I do now, and I didn't. We didn't also didn't expect esports to grow to where it is now, right? You have to think, sure. you have to understand like players are getting paid like five hundred dollars per month to like a thousand or two thousand, and it was it was nothing. It was mainly just a hobby. So we figured that um, if the game was purely based on mechanic and individual skill, then it's really difficult for you know uh, a a region to be so much better than other people. And if, even if you look at like mechanics or in, individual skill right now. Um, th there's not much of a big difference between each of the regions if you look at the major regions, right? Just sure. purely based on laning, yes. mechanical skill. Like if you look at China, they won all stars, but it's like a fun event, right? Um, the reason, the, the big thing we didn't calculate was like teamwork, communication, coaches, support structure, all those things that esports provides now that was not provided back then. Um, it, it's just completely, completely different. Um, it's just completely different ecosystem from what's like what exists and what doesn't exist. And, um, you know, the, the, the culture in Korea is just so much more serious um, and so much more team oriented than North America and Europe and the rest of the other regions. Okay. Because at the time, if people remember, famously, CLG ended up going over to Korea and playing in the OGN seasons. And famously, TSM stayed at home and streamed and played all the Western tournaments. Some of them CLG played as well, but obviously you didn't go to OGN, right? Famously, the storyline people usually bring up is that that was actually better for TSM because, first of all, you won the Western tournaments over CLG anyway, and also, obviously, you kept your big streaming presence, and that's actually kind of when the team kind of overtook CLG to be the most popular, right? Even though that might be the case, does a part of you regret not getting the chance to go to Korea and be there for a season and play those top teams? To, to be honest with you, um, I actually never really think about uh, like I've never really thought about it as a like a from a regrets perspective, um, from like a. Sorry, I'm thinking right now. Actually, yeah, sorry. Right. Uh, more or less, no, because we were able to meet them from an international perspective anyway. So at that time, it was an open circuit, right? So we were able to see those Korean. We we were we met those Korean teams at MLGs and. MLGs and IEMs and whatnot, right? So I don't think it would have been much of a difference outside of playing them like on a weekly basis. And so there's not much regret there. Uh, and like, you know, a lot of people really blame that big move from like the West to Korea. And that's where we overtook CLG. The reason why CLG was overtaken was because they lost at, at, like consistently at those MLG events to us. Had they, had they been us, there would be no difference. So it's like, I think it's like a bullshit cop out reason for them to say, okay. yeah, TSM only overtook us in fan base because we moved over there and it was a terrible business decision. No, you lost because you guys sucked and you guys lost to us consistently over and over in every single tournament outside of MSG. You kind of get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, had they won, then we would just be a shitter brand and we would never caught up, but they lost. So I think it's like a terrible excuse for them to say that. From like uh, moving to OGN, there's not much regret there. I mean, we probably would have still lost anyways, just like how we lost at, at MLG. And I think that uh, I think that that big change and move wouldn't made wouldn't have made sense. But the, let me let me tell you why we didn't do it though. Even though I wanted to, yeah. the reason why we didn't want to do it was because we were the first team in League of Legends to commit to a gaming house, right? So I signed a one year lease in New York to pay for the rent there. And so had we moved to Korea, we would have had to. They would have subsidized it, but we would have moved there and we would have had to pay for the cost to go over there too. Oh, right. And so we'd be paying for double the rent and I couldn't have financially afford that. We had no sponsors at that time. We didn't make that much money. I, we, we were sleeping on lawn chairs, dude. And so like, I just signed a six bedroom house um, lease in New York, Long Island. And for me to move the whole entire team to Korea, 
and cover that cost with some small subsidy. It just didn't make sense. We, I would have gone bankrupt. And so that was a big decision why we didn't go to Korea too. Um, but like, it doesn't make sense for me to mention that publicly way back then, right? Yeah. Okay. Like CLG at that time, they did, they were not, they did not lease a gaming house, so they just flew from like their homes, and so um, that was affordable to them, but it wasn't affordable to us. Okay, so okay, let, uh, you just touched on something now. I want to ask you about then. So at this point in time, your team was already getting pretty famous. Obviously, League of Legends was becoming a big esport. As as people might know, it's true from streaming you could make good money because obviously, especially like back then, the CPMs were pretty crazy when we had owned and we had Twitch compete with each other. But as you just mentioned there, that reminded me of that famous story about the Odd One, where first of all, if you ever watched the Odd One stream, he literally used to just sleep in like a fucking deck chair after the finishing streaming. And then also everyone remembers the famous story where, because he just ate like microwave dinners every day, he actually got scurvy, like, you know, that disease that like sailors used to get from like the 17th century. So huh. it was it was pretty, everyone was pretty dedicated in TSM, right? It was kind of all in. Yeah, everyone, I mean, like, look, everyone went all in, like, uh, especially Alex, right? He went to US, UCSB, he got in there, he had to pay for tuition, and he left that. Odd One was on his last semester for college. He left that. Uh, everyone was in college. They left that. They went all in on this, and we had to make it. So everyone was working insane hours. I mean, I was streaming for like 30 hours straight, falling asleep on my stream. We all like, we did everything we could, and we took it a lot more serious than other teams. So even though we weren't the most talented group of players and we weren't the best, we pro we put in more time and effort than everyone else versus uh, the other teams and other players. They were, you know, they were casually playing 10, 15 hours a day and they would still beat us occasionally. So um, that speaks to how untalented we are. <laughs> sure. Yeah, right. So, uh, okay, let me ask you this then. So what, another reason why I remember the TSM brand getting big, because funnily enough, this was something that affected CLG, was yeah. when they went to Korea... They had no time to make vlogs or to do extra streams and stuff. You know, they were already there all day long. The hours were terrible. Meanwhile, TSM in season two, especially, you not only were streaming, but there would be vlogs after every tournament and people really like engaged with social media in a way that funnily enough, a lot of top teams now don't. But with that said, Reginald, it was in a very much less professional manner. Like I've gone back and looked at some of those old vlogs. <laughs> there's some wild shit in there, bro. Like there's some <laughs> things that people say that like they would definitely not be allowed to say now. So what was kind of the, the mentality around why you were so open with the social aspects of that stuff? I mean, honestly, I, I didn't think too much about it. I, I just knew that we had fans and they wanted to know like about our personal lives. So we just filmed everything we could, right? And at, this, at the same time too, like I, I feel like we're making a lot of excuses for other teams, right? Because if you think about it, TSM makes more content now, than way more content now than we've ever made before, even in the past, right? If you okay. think about a vlog, it takes like 30 seconds. You know, I work way more now than I worked before. I still find time to do these interviews with you. I do an interview every single week. I do stories on my Instagram every single day. I always find time to do content. It's really about just remembering, practicing, building a good habit, and having a routine. When you're in Korea and you're playing solo queue, like solo queue, solo queues are like, Way back then, you have to wait like 30 minutes in a queue time and you still have to do that, right? So you have so yeah. much time throughout the day when you're eating, when you're walking around, when you're looking for food. You have so much time to do this content. And all that content that we filmed, we didn't plan to do it. We just did it. Like when I was rolling in that puddle, we went to eat. There was a puddle on the ground. I was like, I'll give you $50 to roll in that puddle. It'd be really fun if we vlogged it. And that's what happened. Right now, we put so much more time into planning. Like Max, our content team, we put they put so much more time to editing, filming, like planning out things, like setting things up. Like we spend so much more time in content now. So it's not really an excuse to actually say, oh, we went to Korea. We didn't have time to do content. Our team, we practice so much more. Whenever we go to Korea, we still find time to do content and we still have off time. So really it, it was, we just wanted to be more connected to the community because, you know, like as people that didn't ever have attention and that were never really good at anything in our lives, it was, it felt so special to be regarded as special. And so we just wanted to share that with our audience and it, it felt great. And, you know, we still try to do that now. In season two, was this Reginald's prime as a player? Were you at your best in season two? Honestly, I think the biggest regret for me was that like, I love League of Legends and I love competing. I loved esports so much. And, you know, I always think back about it, but I, there's, there's no regrets here is that, in my time of my career, I never really had the opportunity to really just completely be laser focused 
in on my like esports career to play to just be the best player I could ever be. It was always a case of like doing esports for four hours and then working on the back the back end for like you know yeah. eight hours, right? So I, and this is an excuse. Like it, it is what it is. It's just that like I wasn't as good as the other players on an international level, and I'm not trying to make excuses for myself. But uh, I always think back like okay. What kind of player could I have been if I actually was able to dedicate uh, myself full time, be be better, hire a CEO, have someone run everything on the back, and just have me fully focus on my career? And maybe monetarily it didn't make sense, but I never really joined esports or became a player for the money, anyways, right? So I, I think about 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 that from time to time, uh, but you know, uh, don't dwell on the past, right? Uh, so what like what type of player was uh, Reginald in season two? I would say I was the best, uh, you know, mid lane North American player. That doesn't really mean, mean that much nowadays. Um, in the West, I, I was still a, a top competitor. We still we still beat um, like we still beat uh, CU, CLG EU and other European teams from yes. time to time. It wasn't consistent. Um, it wasn't as consistent uh, as like how much they beat us. But I was still a top player at the time and highly regarded. Just not like just not like a Bjergsen or not like a faker you see nowadays, you know? Okay, right. One of the things that is kind of funny in the history of TSM is that obviously when you made this name solo mid, it wasn't when you were in the team and it wasn't when you had the way the team was later. But because people saw you, and first of all, as a player, you were clearly a very aggressive player who just took opportunities you saw. And then you were the shot caller. And then you had players like Odd One, like Dyrus, who pe seemingly from a lot of the interviews, it seemed like you got to kind of tell them what to do or you decided like, right, we're going to go in now. People think that that team, t the name Solo Mid, was because Reggie was like, it's my team. It's all about me. I, I I decide everything. I make all the calls. I'm in charge. Was was it kind of like that in the game? Uh, yeah, it was. Were you a I, bit of a dictator? I wouldn't say dictator, right? Because the thing is that I actually, if you look at the way League of Legends is now, every single every single person communicates for their own role and yeah. what they need to do, and um. Because most players at that time focused on their individual mechanics, I focused on communication and shot calling for what we needed to do as a team, right? And if I had the luxury to like focus on my own role, I maybe would have been able to perform better from an individual perspective. But my mindset was like, okay, well, if someone's not doing it, then I'm going to do it. So I just focused on shot calling uh, a lot more than my own individual play. But like, dude, if you look at like player mentality nowadays. Shot calling is something that you don't want to do. It's like if someone could do it for you, then you'll probably perform a lot better. Just focus on yourself, right? I, like you would never ever see a player like, oh, let me call this. Oh, let me take it. Let let me take the responsibility of calling dragons. Oh, let me take the responsibility of timing buffs. You'll never see that on a team. Trust me. So, <laughs> right? It's like who wants to do more work? Sure. You know what I mean? Take so, the blame. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who wants to do more work? Who wants to take more of the responsibility? So I, I don't think that's like a good perspective to see from it. Uh, and so I wouldn't use the word dictator, but I I made the decision to uh, I made most of the decisions in the game because I was better than uh, my teammates at that specific um, duty. And they they were good at other aspects. They were good at laning. They were good at playing champions. They're Everyone does something on a team, right? Like for Odd One, he did a really good job at timing all the buffs, dragons, etc., and, and wards. And for me, I was better than my teammates at shot calling for the team. And so we did what we were good at. When the Season 2 World Championship happened, you were in this weird scenario where, if everyone remembers, it was where if you were a number one seed in a region... They were going to give four of these teams a uh, bye to the playoffs. But one of the tip five regions couldn't get that. Obviously, there's only four spots. So they drew straws. And in the end, it was actually Korea that didn't get one of these spots. So what happened was when Korea won their group, you had to play them as Ubu Frost in the round of eight, even though technically like they were actually what the biggest favorite for the whole tournament. Right. Added into that, obviously, Woon cheated and looked at the screen. I mean, we have video evidence of it. With all that said, would you have gone further in the tournament if you'd played a different team at that point? Do you think if he hadn't have cheated, you would have won the game? What's your take? Oh, man, dude. I hate these tough discussions, right? Because it's just like... Um, I tried to not focus on the past too much because okay. it is what it is. And What's your feeling for that? Oh. At that, okay, I'm not salty anymore 
it's so long ago. Yes. And if I live life thinking about everything that went wrong in the past, I would be a super salty person. Sure. But at that time, it felt so bad. And I was so disappointed because you have to understand, right? As a young kid, um, like when you're a competitor, when you're an athlete, uh, I think from a mental perspective, that's more important than anything, right? Being sh- mentally sharp that day, being f- completely focused. If you're really focused in your opponent, even though they're better than you, maybe they're distracted. They're, if they don't perform at their best, you can still win, right? Wouldn't yes. you agree? And at at this like at the very point before the match started, when I found out that they cheated, I was so mentally tilted, and everyone on our team was so stressed out and frustrated and angry that I could honestly say that we went into that match like just already playing from behind, right? If you if you go into a match and you're just so frustrated and you felt like things were unfair and you just did you felt completely shitty about the situation, then you're you're just not gonna play your best. And you know, when we called them out for being cheaters and, and nothing happened, we were just so mad. Cause we spent like level ones were I don't know if you follow the game too much, but level ones back in the day and like a gold a gold plays, lead. Right? Yeah. Yeah, first blood had like an insane amount, a high percentage winning, right? Like whoever got first blood had an insane win ratio. So we made, we did most of our prep around first blood. Like for people who don't know back then, teams especially would design like trick invades, you know, yes. so you could try and catch someone out, right? Yeah, they went in our jungle and put five wards down. If you go into someone's jungle and put five wards down across the map and you knew exactly where they're at, that is such a huge advantage because the initial jungle path Basically, what Azubu Frost was able to design for themselves was they they got they, they get this first seven minutes. If you get the right words in the first the very beginning of the game, you get to play the spree first seven minutes for free because you know where the jungle is going to start. So if you know where the jungle is going to start, you know where he's going to end up. So you can avoid all gangs for like five to six seven minutes, and that was such a huge advantage. But I'm not going to even go into it because no one's going to understand. Sure. But we were so tilted that we played like shit. But anyways, look, let's be honest here. Azubu Frost was better anyways. Yes. But it does not mean that we can't win. What felt really bad was that we went into the match and we were so tilted that we couldn't play our best and lose at our best. Now, anyone can always make the argument that you would have lost anyways because they're better. It's yeah. not about that. It's about going to the match and being able to play your best and having fair competition. And it was just really disappointing that they looked at the map and we restarted and they looked at the map again and then they denied it. But like obviously, like they're kids too. They probably didn't understand that that's super fucked up. Uh, and they they did whatever they could to win, and I guess that's that's fine, and it's in the past. But yeah, I'm to be honest with you, I'm not salty about it anymore. I don't I don't wake okay. up and think about it. <laughs> but when it's brought up, I'm just like, oh, terrible yeah. moment in my life, you know? Okay. Well, speaking of that, okay, one of the things that ties into what I said before, where people have this perception of you that you were the dictator in TSM and because you were, I mean, listen, it's understandable. The same scenario happened to Hotshot. If you're a player and you're the owner, people from the outside at least will think, well, you know, how can a teammate address you the same way they would another teammate? They also have to think, well, he's my boss as well, you know, right? In these early days, like when season three came along, Obviously, there were a lot of a lot of arguments between you and Dyrus, you and Expecial, you know, people, you and Chaos, obviously. And some of these are on video. Some of these, the stories just got out or they appeared on streams. What was the dynamic like there? Because from the outside, people only see those incidents. They don't know what the, the relationship was like between you and those players otherwise. Because, I mean, you must know this. Some of them looked pretty bad, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, what's the definition of dictator, right? In order for me to like address this, I need to understand what. Uh, the- like you just get you get to decide everything. You control everything. No one can kind of talk back to you. You're you have full control. Uh, no. So I did not ever have full control. Most like team decisions were made by the team. I just was the most vocal run, right? Because the thing is that like, th- like the problem with CLG is that they had five better players than us, but they were never on the same page. Yes. And even though, like. Even though I was really aggressive um, and I was like frustrated, I wasn't able to communicate myself. I was able to pull everyone on our team together. So even though we were we, we were, we were not as good as them from like a top like ceiling perspective, yes. we were together and we played as a team. And I and I attribute that to myself is that I was able to pull everyone on the same page. Five people doing one thing wrong is better than five guys doing five different things right. Do you kind of get what yes. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, that's a good principle. So, um, and that's what we lived by. That's how we played by. That was that was who our team was, and that was our identity. Now, outside of the outside, yes, I handled things really poorly. I was really immature when I wanted to communicate, uh, and like when I communicated with our, our players or my friends, my peers, I was 
I didn't, never really communicated in the right approach. And I wanted people to understand uh, what I meant, but I wasn't able to do it in a way where they could um, they could understand it easily. And so I did a terrible job at that, but thank God it got done. Um, no, but uh, to be honest with you, I was really mature and I handled things really poorly. I could have done a lot better at it. Okay. Right. Nowadays, obviously, especially in the in, in the modern era that we live in now, social media is so huge that, you know, everything people do is really scrutinized even more than back then. But I wanted to ask this, okay, nowadays, if some sports team, for example, had like a documentary crew following them, they'd probably be really strict and be like, we have to see the footage before it goes out. We have to know what's in there. We have to have a release form, right? When you did for the first LCS split that... Um, Game, uh, Game Cribs, yes, the, the the documentary following you around, right? Some of the f the footage we're talking about of these crazy arguments and and things that made you look very bad were in that documentary, right? Why did you let them take this stuff? Why not at the moment be like, uh, don't put that in, please, bro? Like, you know, some of those scenes, like the one where you're in the van arguing with, especially, they look really bad, right? Well, yeah, so they look really bad, right? But you have to understand Game Cribs was not a show for TSM, but it was a show for CBS, right? Yes. And they wanted a really bad character. So what they did was they made the scene over dramatic and they made the scene they made me the villain way more so than than it was a what actually happened. Even, like you know the ironic truth is that the ironic truth is that not to be salty, that that van argument I was actually in the right, but I never freaking went public to talk about it because I don't really give a shit. Okay. Because the, but like the story, based on the way the story is filmed, you can easily make it seem like someone is completely in the wrong and they look like a douchebag, right? And um, one of the big things that Game Cribs did a bad job at was that they didn't provide context. They didn't show the start of the argument to the end of the argument. Because in a in a 60 minute episode, how can you possibly show like an argument that actually lasted 60 minutes when you have to show everything else? And in order for make to make in order to make game cribs really interesting, you have to have a villain, you have to have a protagonist, you have to make it really spicy and dramatic. And from like a financial perspective and team perspective, all CBS and all like game cribs cared about was making sure that the show got as many views as possible. And yes. for me, because I was already the villain, they didn't mind making me the villain. And for me, in order to make, make TSM as popular as possible, I didn't really mind being the villain either because it's like, okay, if I'm the villain and my teammates are happy being the protagonist, then why not, right? And I didn't really, I did not expect that role or that narrative to be carried on and remembered for so long. And had I remembered that, then I would have asked them to make it way more balanced and fair. Yeah. But one of the biggest issues in that, even in that Van argument, right, was that, for most teams, there was no authority figure, there was no coach, and so yes. someone had to point out mistakes that were being made by players repetitively. If you have a mistake, or if you're if you're if you're doing something wrong and you're constantly doing it wrong, and no one's addressing it, then you're going to constantly mess up on that until it's addressed. And for our team specifically, I made sure to do that, not only for myself, but to every single, for, but for every single person. When I was playing on our team, I was responsible for picks and bans. So I would stay up way longer than everyone else and do all the picks and bands, my, bands myself. And to give you context, that would take like five to eight hours um, just doing that every single week, right? And that takes a lot of time and effort. So whereas like other players would be taking time off, uh, playing silly cube, practicing, chilling, streaming, I would just sit by myself and do picks and bands every single week. And uh, I would also like review our play by myself. I would also, so like I was like the shot caller, the player, the coach. And I was responsible for giving feedback. It was I would it wasn't like a role where I was just a player and I was giving strict feedback to every single player. I actually put time and effort and research into the feedback that I was giving. And so in Game Cribs, it just kind of seemed like I was a player and I was judging every single player. There was actually a lot of thought that came into it. Now, the way I communicated myself obviously was not the most effective and it came off poorly. But when you get into an argument with a, you know, with another peer, and they, they don't really, they're not listening, they don't understand you, you get frustrated and when emotions are high, uh, you raise your voice. And so I did a really bad job at that and I got a lot, I get, I, I'm a lot better at it now. Okay, right. One of the other famous moments from Game Cribs, which is obviously a key storyline in season three, was one of the longtime fav uh, players of TSM and quite a famous player was Chaos, the AD carry. And he yeah. had his own popularity and he was also, you know, one of the figures who was considered along with you, like the Baylife mentality, you know, he was like one of the more vocal ones. Now, funnily enough, even in Game Cribs, you described him as like, he was one of your best friends on the team. Like he was one of the ones that you got along with the best. 
But yeah. everyone remembers Game Cribs, one of the ending episodes is Kaox gets kicked. And a lot of people at the time thought that's because he had a dispute with Reginald. They couldn't get along. Can you give us kind of your, your thoughts on Kaox and why did he have to leave TSM? Yeah, so I think the biggest... So let me let me explain to you what like how I handle TSM now and how I handle TSM how I handle TSM in the past, right? Okay. And so I think the biggest difference is um, my 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 approach. And what I mean by that is that way back then we were all friends, and so when players made mistakes or when they did really bad things, I would just take it personally instead of professionally. And what I meant by that was that like just say if a player stayed out late, they were disrespectful, they didn't they 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 show up late, they don't care, they don't, yes. they're not putting in the practice. I would take it personally. I would I would take it as like, hey, you're my friend. Why would you do this to me? That's super fucked up. Like, you know, I, I spent so much time into this team. I put so much effort into practicing or preparing picks and bands, and you, you're just like, you just don't care. Like, uh, or, like that's super fucked up. But now the way I take the approach is that, like, hey, if you're not putting in the effort, you just don't really care about your professional life as much. And therefore, you don't belong on this team. Do you kind of get what I'm saying? So before yeah, I would take, different, right? yeah, exactly. So before because they're so because I was so close to them and we grew up together. We we're uh, and like I had no experience at all. Every single mistake or every single thing that someone did, I took it personally, and I would just get mad at them. And because they were my friends, I didn't, I didn't have the heart. I didn't have the heart to like say, "Hey, look, like we're gonna replace you. We're gonna fire you." So I would just like, I would just get really angry and raise my voice and yell at them, right? And now the difference is that because esports is professionalized, if a player sh- don't show up on time, there's a consequence for that. If a player um, you know, they get they get drunk before a match. There's a consequence for that. If they if they are not competing at the highest level, there's a consequence for that. They they they'll eventually just get replaced. Before I never that never even crossed my mind. If a player wasn't putting in the time to play solo queue, if they weren't practicing, if they didn't care, if they were just out all night, it was just like it was just really personal, and I would just get really upset uh, because I was so young and I didn't understand anything. I you know, I just started a business. I was playing it full time. I there's just so many things happening and pile, like piled on me that I just I just didn't have time to just stop and think like how to how to approach the situation. So I think that that's that's the biggest difference between how I operate TSM um, then and now. So uh, let's let's dive into the chaos situation. So what's your what's your question? Uh, just why was he kicked? Uh, chaos was kicked because he stopped. He stopped putting in the effort. Um, and to br- provide you context, what I mean by that was, you know, there it was just it was just endless weeks of him not showing up to practice on time. I would have to go into his room and wake him up, and that that was after like a crushing loss of season two. Uh, I think it was yeah, it was a crushing loss of season two, and we went to season three. He just didn't he didn't put that much effort in. He would wake up late every day. I would go to his room, wake him up, drag him to practice every single day. And then the final straw was when we went to, um, I think it was, it was a, it was a Dallas tournament. I yeah, forgot. it was MLG, but it was just a play day of LCS was there. I remember it. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, the very first day of the tournament, he stayed out to 6 a.m. and he went drinking. And, you know, I sat him down with Jack and I was like, I told him that that was completely unacceptable, right? You can't do that. And, um, the next day, he shows up late again to practice, like 40 minutes late. And he had like some fan. He took her uh, backstage and showed her around. And we spent like the whole morning, like all four players, we spent the whole morning. We went, we went there and we we were practicing. We, we did picks and bands together. And then he showed up like 30 minutes before we went on stage. And we had this whole entire uh, draft planned out. And what he decided to do is he decided to not follow, follow our draft, even though the other four players spent like countless hours um, planning the draft, picks and bands, and strategy around it. He he showed up late again, and um, and that, that was the final straw. It's like he showed up late two days in a row. He didn't care. We told him how serious it was, and uh, when we went back, we were expecting him to apologize, right? And he didn't apologize. He just said, "I won't do it again." He didn't apologize, and you know, we operated our team back then way more on an emotional basis and a friendship basis than like a business perspective, right? Sure. So we expected him to apologize. And had he apologized and been like a bro, we would have yeah. kept him on the team and had him be a starter. But I was so upset at the fact that he didn't apologize because I took everything so personally that we decided to find, uh, we, we decided to look for other options. But it, it wasn't like just one event. It was just countless weeks of just being late, not taking his job as seriously. And when we when we gave Wild Turtle the opportunity, it just felt like a huge breath of fresh air. He was so serious. He played so much solo queue. He showed up to practice every day on time. And when we brought him to LCS and uh, we won, it, uh, you know, 
it it, it definitely revitalized everyone. It brought back that, that winning spirit. It gave everyone a huge breath of fresh air. And so we decided to just go with Wild Turtle instead. Okay, um, because this is actually something I want to ask about, okay? Because if you remember the first LCS split, when LCS began, there was what was called the Big Four. It was TSM, it was CLG, it was Dignitas, and it was Curse. These were the big teams that had obviously had all the big placings the year before in Season 2. They were the ones that had, like, real orgs with sponsors and money. Whereas the others, if you remember the bottom four at the time, it was only N8 Team League, were the teams that were, like, you know, they were, like, brand new teams or they were, like, up-and-comers. And what's funny is everyone actually really thought in the first split, it'll just be between these four, you know, like, we'll see what order it comes out in, and then they'll definitely win. But what happened was, initially... Actually, CLG, uh, no, initially it was Dignitas and Curse were the two who were leading the league. They were doing amazingly. They were winning all the early games. Meanwhile, TSM and CLG were doing a little bit worse. And then what happened was TSM made this player change. You got Wild Turtle. And when the playoffs began, everyone else except TSM fell apart. Like CLG lost to the Vulcan team, if you remember. Dignitas lost to GG University, who actually also then beat Curse. And then you ended up just playing GG University in the final. You never even had to play these other three teams. And funnily enough... From there on out in LCS, it was just TSM, and it wasn't until Cloud9 came along you had a real rival, right? I actually thought this was an interesting example because you made a very cutthroat move. You cut out Chaos, who obviously was a very good player at the time, and you did it for these key reasons, and you got in this sub, and it kind of turned your season around, right? And it made TSM the best team where actually the other teams fell apart. So what do you think the reasons are? Why was TSM able to become the clear number one until Cloud9 came along? You have to look at it from a cultural perspective, right? Not not just like a, a single player perspective. The, the honest truth is that Wild Turtle was just not. I mean, he was good, but he was not that good. Like, he he was strong mechanically at that time, but he he um he was a solo queue player. He didn't know like to play as like a true a true pro. He didn't know when to like. He he was he would always just push 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 push. Sure. And what I mean by that is when you always push your boundaries you also open yourself up to huge liabilities, right? Yes. And so, like, if you have a huge gold league in League of Legends, if, as long as you play safe, you pretty much win if you just play smart, right? But he would open himself up to huge liabilities where if he gets caught or whatever, we can lose the game. And so he wasn't that much better than Chaos, but because he but because he took the game a lot more seriously at that point, he had a much higher ceiling, and we were super excited about that. But the reason why TSM became a lot better was because by getting rid of Chaos for just completely... For by getting rid of Chaos, right? Because he wasn't serious, it made everyone on our team be more serious. Do you kind of get what I'm saying? Is that like yeah. everyone is in a culture of slacking, not caring, uh, taking time off, and just taking the game not seriously? And you see this one guy who stopped taking the game seriously, and he gets removed. That is that was that that was actually the milestone. Like that was at the very point for an organization like TSM to really start operating like a like a professional organization. Is is the very moment that I decided to replace Chaos because of um, you know, because of what he did. And when we did that from a cultural perspective, I took the game more seriously because I felt like I needed to prove myself to the community. That was like the one season where I didn't make all stars, even though I was so much better than Skara, because sure. the community hated me. Right. Yeah. And so for me as a player and as a team owner, I felt like more than ever, I needed to prove myself to the community that this move is right. So I practiced more hours than ever. The rest of our teammates as well, we're like, okay, like, are we really going to like become a shitty team, a shitty organization because we replaced one player? It was a huge pride thing. Expressional was like, Expressional, uh, in the relationship between Expressional and Chaos, it was the same thing. Um, you know, uh, Chaos was the alpha player and Expressional was like, you know, he just did whatever Keok said. Yeah, yeah. And at, at that very moment, too, he was like, I have a lot to prove here. If if a Keok leaves and I start performing like crap, that means that I would go down in history as someone that got carried. Yeah. So he practiced harder than ever. And Odd One and Darius did the exact same thing. So it wasn't so much that, like, we recruited Turtle and he carried our team. It was it was a combination. Uh, it was a combination of things. And that's why I think... Korea is so much better. They had that mentality and they operated like a professional organization well before we all did. You know, it took yeah. TSM several seasons to really get that right. I was like, TSM operated as just like a, a, a group of friends that didn't know what they're doing. When people made mistakes, when people messed up, when people didn't show pra- practice on time, the consequence was like Reginald yelling at them. And yes. I thought that like, I thought that that was like appropriate, but 
from a professional standpoint, that is so inappropriate. I, I, I don't know. At least, yeah, yes. that is so inappropriate. Like, I'm so disappointed in myself. But it took like I didn't know. I had to learn, right? And so now, really, the approach is like these are the expectations. If you don't live up to these expectations, then you can join a team that doesn't live like that doesn't that doesn't have these expectations, and that's what it is. Okay. So I have a question along these lines then, actually, which is that what you're kind of saying here is like you agree if you were argued with someone or if you were like you were, you were raising your voice, yeah, that's inappropriate for an owner, but the intentions were good. So what I want to ask is this, okay, you used the word there, culture, and that's actually something that I noticed over the last few years with TSM is that it's actually one of the first Western League of Legends org that seem to actually have a team culture. Because if, at this point in time, every member of the original lineup has now been replaced. None of them are there. But TSM still has the same culture because you've enforced it, right? So unlike other teams, like at the time when we talk about season three, teams like Curse and like CLG, if anyone knows internally what their drama was like, it was a fucking joke. There was like people all over the place arguing and be, as you're saying, not being professional, like like having disagreements and not, not being on the same page. Meanwhile, in TSM, okay, maybe you went about it the wrong way sometimes, but you've been able to stress this idea that we're going to play a certain way and practice a certain way, even when none of these players were in the team and you're bringing new people in to train them up that way. And it's become to some degree like a San Antonio Spurs, New England Patriots scenario where you can, again, you can replace all the players, but they always play like the same sort of team, same sort of org, right? Absolutely. And dude, building that culture is took significant risk. Honestly, I got really lucky. And it was really scary. Well, the time we replaced Chaos, I actually, I, at the time we replaced Chaos because he was one of my best friends, it was way more emotional taxing than like thinking if I could do it or not. But you have to remember, right? When we replaced Chaos, he was one of the very best players in his position. And when we replaced X Special, he was probably the absolute yes, best support good, in the West. Yeah. We didn't replace X Special because he wasn't a good player. We replaced him because it was a cultural. Uh, from a cultural perspective, he didn't fit. He, he didn't fit with the team identity that I wanted. I wanted TSM to be, and that's why he got replaced. Expressional got replaced because he started to become lazy and he didn't put in as much effort as what I, what I wanted. Right? I wanted okay. TSM to be the most hardworking team to put in the most effort uh, because that's where that's how I got here, dude. I'm so untalented at everything I do, and the reason why I'm where I'm at is because I put more effort than. Practically, uh, most of my peers are the pe my competitors, and I wanted TSM to be about playing as a team, putting in the hard work, and really, you know, just slowly inching towards our goals. And so, like, but but like when we replaced X Special and we put in Gleeve, I was like, God, we're probably gonna do really bad this season. X Special is so good, but I have to do it because I want to stick true to what TSM is about, and I and I think that like in the long run, it will pay off. And I got so lucky with Lust Boy. I, I swear to God, Loco, yes. Loco saved my life. I got so lucky with Lust Boy. Had we not picked up Lust Boy, it would have been difficult. We maybe would have gone to the finals in NALCS, but we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have won. And so, uh, like, there was, there was some grit to it, but it was some luck. Like, you need a lot of both. You need to work hard. Sure, yeah. You need the luck. Uh, but I was confident that in the long run things would work out, but I got lucky in the short term. I have to say that no matter what. Okay. So you referenced him before, but obviously Jack, Jack Etienne, now owner of Cloud9, was in TSM The Org. And for people who don't know his background, he comes from, he worked with that site Crunchyroll, which was like streamed anime web uh, episodes. And so obviously, unlike a lot of people in esports, he had a really good understanding of how to sell sponsorships and how to explain, you know, what are now very common to CPM, you know, like views per minute, like demographics. He understood all these basics. You can see he was clearly cut out to work in esports and the modern context to get sponsorship because that's always been a very big deal until perhaps now where maybe other revenue streams are going to open. Now, mm -hmm. When he was in TSM, was when TSM started to get these sponsors, etc. Afterwards, when he went to Cloud9, even though he technically wasn't in TSM anymore, Cloud9, I noticed, often had the same sponsors. They often were still very close with TSM. It looked like there was a lot of similarity, right? Some yeah. people who don't like Reginald are going to hate on you and they're going to say, Jack secretly sort of like he got Reggie all those sponsors and the money and he kind of like must have helped Reggie along the way because, you know, I mean, you don't have a degree in business or whatever, you know. Is there any truth to that? What kind of role did Jack play in, in TSM and in your career? Uh, he played a huge role, right? Like th the thing is that those people are just salty. You don't really accomplish anything in life without other people around you without having a good support system. 
Like no one, no one becomes successful or no one does anything on their own. Like name one person that actually becomes truly su- successful on their own athletes, right? They need sure. good coaches. They need a good support environment. They need a good family. They need someone there to help them, um, emotionally, whether, wherever it is, wherever it is, whoever it is, right? You can always point to someone that's helped you out for me. Sure. I wasn't good at that, but was I able to befriend someone that helped me get there? Yes. And Jack has been such a big part of my life to help me grow as a person, to help me grow as a business professional. Dude, he can have all the credit. I don't care. Jack has been so helpful in my career. And yes, he did help me there. Did I put in effort? Did I put in work? Did I was I did I uh, contribute? Yes, I absolutely did. But I would not be where I'm at without my players, without Special Chaos, Bjergsen, uh, my brother, and pretty much Jack. Everyone around me, really, like Riot Games, like, like all the publishers, uh, the fans, you know? So, <laughs> as I don't really I get that. Okay. So, in Season 3, which was obviously the end of your playing career, you got to go to Worlds. And at Worlds, you famously, you were in the same group as SK Telecom, and that was the rookie year of Faker when he was obviously blowing everyone's minds. You actually got to play against Faker. What's Faker like to play against? Oh my god. Uh like okay, let me let me add a little extra question. Like did you come into that tournament actually thinking you could beat him? So, as a competitor, you always go into a tournament thinking like you have the chance to win. But when I played against him, it felt really uncomfortable, right? And at that time, his mechanical ceiling was so much higher than mine that I felt like I was put in a position where I had to play to not lose. And go even. So, like as a as a pro player, you play to win and smash your opponent. If yes. so, like you have to look at the five lanes, right? And you have to look at like the champion you have. Are you supposed to win your lane with this matchup or not? If I have the winning matchup, I'm always going to play to win because that's how you have to play the game. Otherwise, you're just going to be a loser. If you have the advantage, you have to push your advantage. If you're scared sure. to push your advantage, you're going to lose. So, um, I played the matchup. When I played Faker, I played the matchup. But I can tell you, uh, it was one of like the most uncomfortable playing experiences that I've had in my career was because from a mechanical standpoint, um, he was just better than me. And he he was playing solo queue a, a lot more hours than I did at the time. And I wasn't. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to step down was that from a cultural perspective, if I'm really pushing this narrative, everyone has to put in st- all this effort. We want to be world champions. How can I stick true to that same messaging if I don't kick myself for not putting in the same hours as everyone else, right? Sure, yeah. So that, that's why I replaced myself was that like, am I really going to hold my team back because I can't be as me- strong as Faker mechanically? When I played against Faker, he just he shit on me because his mechanics were so good compared to mine. C- could my mechanics be as good as him if I had the same amount of time? Maybe, but realistically, am I going to be able to put in that many hours? No. Mm-hmm. Now, honestly, like Faker was so much better than me. He, he shit on me. And so I, I retired myself because like I said again, it would not fit the same cultural message that I'm pushing onto my players. And I would be a hypocrite and double standard if I kept myself on the team if I if I can't help the team win. You know, I want like I created TSM to be the very best League of Legends org and to win worlds. And I say that now and it seems like such a joke, but I can tell you, every single move that I do, I try to inch towards that. Is it realistic for us to win worlds this year? no like I, I can't confidently say we will but am i making small steps to get there from like a financial perspective from a roster perspective yes if you look at all the moves csm made this offseason we're always trying to inch ourselves there Why, right. since you've mentioned already like uh, even back before this time you had to be the owner as well as the player so you couldn't always practice as much as everyone else you had to do things around the team also you had to obviously make decisions for the team so there's a lot more stress there a lot more things to think about right could there have been a, an alternate timeline where reginald's still super driven but for whatever reason you don't make a team you're just a player but now you're just driven to be the best player could you have seen this happening as, a, as an alternate way your life could have gone and you would have just you would still be playing now maybe Absolutely. I, before I created TSM and before before uh, CLG existed, TSM as a group, right? We actually, I as a player, we actually applied to like teams like Complexity, SK, Evil Geniuses, and they didn't want to invest in League of Legends. They didn't want to have an esports squad, and so I created my own. So absolutely, like it, there there could have been like twenty different alternative realities. I'm so lucky and so blessed that things happened the way they they did, you know. Uh, and so yes. 
I could just be a player. I could still be playing now. Honestly, if I was only a player, I could probably be still in LCS now. Um, and yeah, I mean, things panned out the way they did, and I'm grateful for it. Okay, right. Well, when you did retire yourself and you did bring in a new player to replace you, obviously a pretty good decision because he's still playing right now in Season 8, and it was Bjergsen. Now, when you brought him in, obviously he himself at different times in his career has been known to be a little bit fiery and to some people say he's stubborn. And obviously he's the main player in the team. He's been the superstar player every year. At times he's even been a bit of a shot caller. Did you actually see in Bjergsen like someone you kind of could relate to yourself? Like he's kind of he's kind of a bit like me. Yes, because um, he really valued his position and he really wanted to join TSM. Um, you know, way back when, right? We had the so no one really knows about this, and it's been so long now that I can talk to talk yes, about it. On. But like the at that very moment in time, we had. We we had we were choosing between a couple of players. Everyone wanted to join our team at that time, right? Because we were so popular. Joining TSM meant like meant a lot, a lot sure. back then. And so we were choosing between like Bjergsen and uh, Expecte at that time. We were choosing between Bjergsen and Expecte at that okay. time. And at that time, had that ever gone public, everyone would have just hated me for not going with Expecte. I mean, everyone now, would say take Expecte at the time, right? Exactly, everyone. exactly. Uh, and I went with Bjergsen because he just wanted the position so much more. And like just hearing his narrative and his story was just so interesting to me, right? Like Bjergsen is a kid that was never really good at anything and he got bullied and yeah, yeah. Uh, he found something he was good at and he was so driven and passionate about it. And he put in so much effort. Like he was one of the players that streamed a lot when he was playing. He was good. He put in so much effort. He played all the time. He loved it. And uh, he was just at the start of his career, whereas Expecte was already in his career for a long time. He's trying to find balance. He was he's trying to find balance in or in order to be truly really good at something, you have to be in balance. Uh, that's you have to be pretty imbalanced, right? Like you gotta be kind of obsessed, right? You can't kind of exactly. chill out and have a fun time. Exactly. And Expecte worked hard, don't get me wrong, but but Bjergsen just fit so much more well with what I what I wanted. Cause yeah, like what I saw on Bjergsen was what I saw in me, dude, honestly, I sucked at everything in life. Like in school, I wasn't super good. Um, and um, practically By everything the way, I did. On, on those lines, I actually heard something along those lines. I heard, I think it might even have been in one of the Riot videos. Wasn't it something like everyone else in your family, all your brothers were like killing it in school, like 4.0. And you were kind of the guy where they were like, oh, there's old Reggie. Like, you know, he's not, he's not, he's, he's a special case. You know, we, we just, we love him anyway. Like, right. It's kind of harsh like that, right? <laughs> that is absolutely true. So as soon as like, I found League of Legends and I was rank one and I was actually good at something in my life. I wanted to hold on to it. it feels so, I wanted to hold on to it so bad. Like, if you're bad, if you've been an average at everything in your life and you found if you found something that you can feel special about, and having that special feeling makes you feel so good. I w I was greedy. I wanted to hold on to. It. I was, yeah, yeah. While being good at something feels so good, I want to be good at it. I want to continue to be good at it. I want to be good at other things. And so, because I was greedy and I really wanted to be good and I really wanted to feel special, I put in so much effort and so much work to just continually have to continue having that feeling. And so, I felt like Bjergsen would have really valued uh, valued the opportunity more versus someone that was already established and successful. And so, uh, I went with I went with I went with him. And that was, you know, I have to say that's probably one of the best business decisions I've made in my life, picking sure. up Bjergsen because. If you look at what stays consistent is our, our culture, and he's able to do that. Um, and he's just awesome to work with. So, yeah, like fucking, I'm still happy to this day, dude. Clap for me right now. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. So, and it, if we flash forwards in time, because listen, by the way, that tells you that you've had a successful career. Like in anyone else's interview, it would be like, right, if they won LCS, obviously there'd be like a 20 minute segment about every match they played in the run, but you were in every LCS final. So we can't go into all of them, guys. Like they, everyone knows the basic story. So we're going to skip to the big moments. Right? So <sighs> I want, thing I wanted to ask you about was obviously Loco Doco was the first true coach of TSM. Aside from you doing a little bit beforehand, he was like an officially brought in to be the coach and he was there for many of the titles and many of the great times. But we've addressed in other videos some of his problems and some of the things you had to step in on, right? How would you summarize Loco's time in, career, in TSM, the good and the bad? Loco's best decision ever for TSM was to pick a blessed boy. He was really good. At, he, I mean, he picked up Lust Boy, and that was his, that was the most he's ever done for TSM. Uh, 
let me think. The bad? I mean, at the same time, right, when we picked up Loco, coaching was really new, and no one really sure. knew yes. what, what that meant. Our goal was to try to prof- professionalize esports and try to work towards uh, having a, a better cult- culture. I think that for, for someone like him, he was way too immature to actually like, Let help. me ask you this. Let me throw in some context, okay? Maybe this will help. Yeah. So when you said all that stuff about like people like Chaos, especially even if they were really good friends of yours, if they started to lose motivation or in the other cases, you know, they were a little bit too lax, they messed around too much, that pissed you off, right? Well, here's yeah. the problem. I know a lot of people might not know this, but one of Loco's big flaws as he's been growing up as a person is he has been someone who who likes to mess around and have fun and sometimes have a bit too much fun. And if you're the coach, that can be unacceptable, right? Was that ever a problem? I, I think that I think that was one of the greater issues. I mean, I, I don't want, I don't really want to address it too much, sure. right? Yeah, um, I just wondered what you'd say. So I'm a, I'm just gonna get, answer this question in a very general basis. I think uh, Loco, he is a great coach. Now it took him a long time to improve to get to the point where he is. Uh, but at the time where uh, he was coaching TSM, uh, he needed to be he needed to be a lot better to really take TSM to the next level. Um, what TSM has been looking for for the last like four or five, like really three, four years was is international success, right? Yes. And the harsh, honest truth is that we haven't found international success outside of IEM Katowice, and that yes. was just like a one small sample. Exactly, yeah. And um, you know, uh, so I felt like I felt like due to TSM's recruiting power, we are we are able to consistently win an A or take top two is because of how good our talent is, but not necessarily how much better our infrastructure or our team has improved from like a, a, a like a, a team perspective right like yes. if, you, if you look at it at the world stage what separates samsung from skt to tsm is how well they play as a team not how good they are me- mechanically or individually when you yes. get that wrong you don't like on the world stage do you really see like certain lanes just completely smash well, other lanes and just I win think, a game because of that i anymore? think you've no. got a good example for this year because i actually listen people in people on reddit will go mad because they obviously think all koreans are the best but i wouldn't say that all of samsung's players are better than tsm's no way i actually think samsung's a really good example of winning as a team you know they don't have like the faker of every role no way they don't even exactly. have faker obviously <laughs> exactly so you win championships by playing as a team right now and Unfortunately, even though TSM tries, I mean, that's our main focus really is like, how do we play better as a team? Even though that's our biggest focus, we still haven't been able to get our team play to an international level yet. And so um, that's up to the players, that's up to the coaches. Uh, I, I try to be involved, but really, like, most of the time, the coaches get the final decision on TSM unless things go really poorly. And so um, the reason why we've changed coaches some so many times is because they haven't been successful at that. And on top of that too, it, it's it, it just goes to a bigger issue, right? Is that like um, not only does TSM need to push our region, but our like uh, our competitors are constantly looking to improve too. So I think that from an in- infrastructure standpoint, most of these other NA- LCS organizations are investing a lot more into their infrastructure. So hopefully, NA NA as region gets better. But like if you look at overall, like if you look at Korea, right? On average, our teams are way better than our teams. And so, um, in order for the top team to be really, really good in our region, the other teams also need to be better too. Sure. So, okay, here's the funny thing. When when Doublelift joined TSM, obviously, as as fans, that's very shocking because it's like, you know, so it's like someone going from one massive team that's the big rival of the other one to the other. You know, if it happens in sports, obviously, it's a very big deal as well. But what a lot of people might not know is that TSM had already given double lift offers in the past. There was times in the past where you'd asked him to join or there's a chance he could have joined or maybe Expression wanted him to join. You know, there's a few stories I've heard over the years, right? In that moment where you got double lift, yes, obviously they'd won LCS. So, you know, it's a good time to get like their star player, etc. But was any part of you put off by the stories, which listen, as far as I've heard from his teammates, some of them are true, that he was a very hard player to work with and he did have kind of a domineering personality and maybe he was disruptive for teammates. Was any part of you put off by that and worried like, will I be able to control him? Will I be able to get a good relationship with him? So first off, we never ever made a double up an offer. Okay. Maybe those are just rumors then. Yeah. So whatever the narrative is, we never ever made double up an offer until we actually made him an offer for him to join. Okay. It It was always like, it was always a discussion, like for TSM, right? We explore every single option to try to make our team better in the off season. But a lot of people just say that they get offers from TSM, like okay, just just basically to make their self worth more. Uh, 
during that specific season, right? Because if you get an offer from PSN in the offseason, your value as a player it gets doubled. That's just the honest truth of it. So if, if another team hears that we're talking to that team, don't just from like uh, a FOMO perspective, they're just going to offer that player more, even yeah. without confirming the source. Because like, are they going to go to me and be like, "Hey, did you offer this player <laughs> yeah, or something?" You know that. what I mean? So there's like a lot of rumors there that are just absolutely not true. Um, and um, from a double perspective, really, like we don't. When we made the decision, we didn't really put too much thought into it, right? The way I see it is like, what is our skill cap, and can we change them or not? Like, what's the likeliness of us changing them? And Dubliff was uh, really like uh, when he joined our team, he was really pleasant to work with. He's super easy. Like, he's he's a nice guy. But uh, we didn't see any of those issues, really. Why do you think then he had his problems in the past teams? Do you think? What do you think was different about CLG, for example? They CLG didn't have a a, a leader and uh, um, a single person to really just shape that culture, right? Like I think that. Having someone to tell everyone and get everyone on the same page is incredibly important to any team or organization within esports or outside of esports. Uh, and I think that um, I'm not exactly sure too much about what happened on CLG because a lot of it's like he said, she said. Yes. So I didn't yes. really think about it too much. But when I, we picked up Double Up, this is what I thought: like, what, where, where are we now with our roster? And if I made this change, would we do better internationally? And that that's basically what it what it came down to. Okay. Is double at that time? They were he was he was better than Wild Turtle, and we just came off from a a disappointing loss. And I'm if I'm always preaching and saying like, look, I'm I'm willing to do what it takes to freaking yeah. have a success on the international stage, and I go into the next year keeping the same roster. Like I said, throughout my whole entire career, what's really brought me here and what's really kept me here is that I've been true to what TSM has been about, right? And uh, everything I do, uh, I work towards that. And so if I just decided to keep the same roster because they got along, they're friends, and we can still win an, win an ALCS, then that's just a huge letdown to our audience, our fans, and everyone around me, and to myself. So yeah, Double F was the best option at the time, so we signed him. Right. At that point in time, obviously in the summer split of Season 5, like I said, CLG won. They beat TSM in the final. Actually, they won the next split as well when you had the lineup where you had Yellow Star initially. And they, so they won two back-to-back -back splits. Now, people might forget, CLG famously had never made an LCS final. In fact, usually they would bomb out in the first round of the playoffs and they would always kind of disappoint. You know, they'd look good in the regular split. Something would go wrong. They'd have their arguments. They'd bomb out. You could kind of set your clock by it. You knew it was going to happen every season, right? Yeah. So when they won these two titles back-to-back, you know, they pretty quickly, all of a sudden, they had a couple of titles. And I think you at the time only had three titles or something. You know, like suddenly yeah. they were right back in it. Was it was it at all worrying that CLG was suddenly the ones that were at number one maybe and maybe TSM is just going to be a good team now? Did you always know you could get back to the top again? Uh, this seems... <laughs> all right, so let me walk you through my thought process, right? You're going to be like, okay. oh, he thinks on. on a really simple level and you're going to make on. fun of me. <laughs> you're going to make so much fun of me. When I think about making changes for TSM, I don't think about my competitors at all. I just only think about how do I make TSM better internationally. And if I make TSM better internationally, it will it will naturally lead to domestic results, period, right? Makes sense, yeah. So I'm not like, oh, if I take double F away from CLG, are they going to be worse and we're going to win? I, I, don't, I don't think about that at all. I just think about okay. how to make team better. This makes teams better. I'm going to do it. I'm going <laughs> to okay. do this. It's working and, for you. The blueprint's working. <laughs> the blueprints are working. So that's that's as simple as it is. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, that 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 goes as much to talk about the double up situation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. When uh, you had this team, because obviously Double Lift has now left the team, so we can talk about his time in the squad. Right. When he was in the team, is the period when not only did you win all the LCS splits after this first one where you had the problems, and you obviously, obviously people know there's the whole coaching scenario that went on there, and there was a, there was a lot more problems than just the team there, right? When you had all this domestic success and you went to the two worlds, you rightfully were actually hyped up these times, I thought. You know, some of the past seasons, I didn't think the TSM teams were that great. What's mad is I actually look at those lineups. The, the same team obviously went to season six and season seven worlds. And even when I look at the lineup now and I look at your group, it still feels like you should have gotten out. You should have had a good run. Doublelift and Bjergsen, were, they were in top form, you know. Do you look back now and wonder how, how did it go wrong? Is some of it is still a mystery? Uh, no, it's not a mystery, right? We got what we deserved. I mean, the thing is that... Um, TSM, we had a really high ceiling, but in NA, 
we won because we kept pushing our lead, pushing our lead, pushing our lead, and we uh, we just completely stomped on high mechanical level. So when we went to Worlds, our, our mechanical ceiling was higher than other players, but our, our teamwork wasn't as good. And so matches that we got a gold lead, we would just completely... Like, we stomped Samsung like 14-0 in one of the games, right? Completely crushed them. It's because we, our team was really good mechanically, and when we got a, a gold lead, we stomped. But the thing is that we didn't know how to play the other style, which is if you don't have a gold lead, you have to play smart, you have to play safe, you have to not push your limits, and you have to wait for an opportunity. In NA, we just completely just we went seventeen and zero, seventeen and one. We just completely yes. smashed everyone, and so we were super good at smashing people, but we weren't good at playing from behind. We weren't good at uh, playing even. And so if we don't get like the first gank off, then you have to wait till another opportunity. But TSM was always just pushing our limits, pushing our limits, pushing our limits, pushing our limits, and we didn't get punished for it. So when we went to Worlds, that was the first time we got punished for it. And that's when it really, really, really mattered. And that's why we lost Worlds. It's because we just weren't good enough. Now, did we, like that year, could we have made semis and finals? Yes, we had the opportunity to make semis and finals if we if we got lucky if our if our um, if a couple ganks were to go off if double didn't get caught uh, to Victor if 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 a bunch of other decisions didn't happen but we made yeah. those decisions because we were inexperienced so uh, I don't want to make excuses for our team we lost because we weren't good enough and that's one of the reasons why I mean it seems like a huge cop out and excuse but in order for like the top NA teams to perform well internationally they need to be punished by their competitors. Uh, several times in a row, consistently every single week, for them to for them to improve. So by the time they do get to Worlds, they get punished so much by doing all these small mistakes that when they do get to Worlds, they don't do them, and then they can win internationally. Okay. So Cloud Nine needs to get Cloud Nine needs to get like punished constantly by their competitors um, domestically. So when they do go to Worlds, they don't like do things that are bad that are considered good, like sure. that, that they think is good. You kind of get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So like one of the reasons, uh, or at least in my past interviews, when I explained that concept, I see it seemed like I was just making excuses, but it's really honestly a problem. Is that like if you can beat someone right by doing something that actually isn't good, but you think is good, then that really mentally screws your mind when you go internationally. And you're like, look, I'm gonna go in with a super strong plan. It works every single time. It never fails me. Then all of a sudden, it's just a terrible plan, and you figure that out on stage, and you're just like. I can't believe I thought this was actually good. Do you kind of get what I'm saying? Sure, so. yeah, yeah. Okay, so listen, in interviews, it's very rare I'm ever actually part of the topic, right? But I have to ask you this, Reginald, if I've got the, if I've got the opportunity now while you're here before me. So during this timeline of TSM, there was a time in season four, and this was when I used to work for the website On Gamers, and me and Monty started our show, Summoning Insight, and we'd only done, we hadn't done that many episodes. I think we'd only done something like maybe maybe like 10 or 11, you know, we hadn't done too many. It was obviously like roughly every week or so. And listen, while I understand this piece of context, which people always forget, is that Monty was at the time the coach of CLG. He was the coach of your direct rival. So already you're probably going to be listening to what he's saying and thinking like, is he biased, you know, et cetera. But can you explain to everyone now, why did you <laughs> blacklist on gamers and say no more interviews with Thorin, like fuck these guys, sort of. Well, you didn't literally say fuck these guys, but you made a video where you were like, we won't be working with these people. Can you explain that to me? What the oh my was God. Like? Can you jog my memory? That's been so long ago. I forgot. <laughs> okay, wait, I'm trying to think. Let me try to think. Okay. One second. So um, at that time, right, journalism was really new and harsh critical feedback was really new. And sure. It, it was just really new to me, and I saw that you guys were just like trashing on Jack, trashing on us, and I didn't really like read too much into it. I was just like, well, these guys are freaking like, okay, when you guys are responsible for giving critical feedback, right? Yes. Sometimes you guys are going to be right, sometimes you guys are going to be wrong. For sure, yeah. And I only focused on the things that you guys said that I felt like was incorrect, and that was just simply not true. And I didn't really focus on the fact that like, okay, it's your job to be critical, and sometimes you guys are going to be right, sometimes you guys are going to be wrong. I just thought of it as like, okay, I don't like these guys. I'm just not going to deal with them. So I'm just not going to work with them anymore. And I mean, from a really simple perspective, that's just exactly why I made that decision. And okay. now thinking back about it, it's like, it's really immature. I mean, to just like blacklist someone, I could have just gotten a call with you just to talk about like what's true, what's not true, or do an interview sure. to talk about it. Yeah. But like, you know, um, I was a freaking really emotional little kid, right? So it's like, okay. this is how I feel. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that. That's it. All right, peace. Yes. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, that, I, that's 
as simple as it is, that just answered your question right there. Yeah, makes sense. Right, I have another question like that, though, I have to ask. This is a tough one, though. So I want to just mm -hmm. get your real thoughts on this. Don't Listen, just because we're doing an interview now, don't feel like you have to be nice or anything. So if you remember, another thing that happened was when we did the Summoning Insight right after that move where you blacklisted us, I made a joke where I said you had the character like the character <laughs> from... Uh, Planet of the Apes, Caesar, because if you remember, he's like a very dictatorial leader and he's like a strong guy. So I want to ask you this. What did you actually think at the time? Did When you heard this, did you actually think that was a racist comment? I'm genuinely interested to know. Did you? Thorn, you're so racist. Jesus Christ. No, okay, look, look. Uh, okay. No, I, I, honestly, I didn't, I didn't care. If you think about it, you're obviously not a racist person. Uh, you know, I just thought it was funny that you did, you used that term and you got shit on it. It was a bad analogy when I looked back now. Probably <laughs> not the analogy. best one. Yes. Look, at the end of the day, people make mistakes. They say shit, right? They don't mean all the time. And honestly, I was not offended that I felt like you're a racist. I just thought okay. like, I hate this guy. He hates me. Whatever. We don't exactly, have to get along. Yes. Screw it, you know? Okay. So, uh, yeah. I mean, putting me on the spot, I don't think you're racist. Uh... Yeah, that's, it is what it is. Okay. Well, then what changed then? Because people have noticed, not just doing interviews with me, which is obviously a big step, but it feels like TSM has sort of changed its policy on how it does media and stuff, right? Like now you're not as combative or there's not certain people. It's like, you, it seemed like you kind of said it there. Like now it's more like if there's a problem, let's do an interview about it. Let's, let's talk about it, right? Well, I mean, in simple words... I like okay. In simple words, I grew up as a person. I became more mature, right? Uh, I I listen to people's issues, hear hear what they have to say. Before you have to understand, like just growing up uh, in this specific environment, there was just so. I mean, there was just so much pressure on me to not fail. I was so stressed out. I dropped out of college. There's a lot of expectations from a like a family perspective, from a fan perspective, and even from like a competition perspective. Um, I I made a lot of decisions based on uh, being emotional. And I think the biggest change from then till now is that I, I, I've gotten a lot better at controlling my emotions and really just being logical, reasonable, and trying to really think of solutions more so than focus on being frustrated. Uh, it's a really simple analogy, right? Don't like dwell, don't dwell on things. Don't like cry over spilled milk. Yeah. Uh, I focus a lot more on figuring out like, okay, what is the issue? How do I fix this issue? How should I feel about things? What's a more appropriate way to feel about it? More so than just like raging over the internet, like tweeting things that are controversial. Um, you know, where like I have to be more professional. I we work with bigger partners now that I'm so proud of. Um, we have a huge uh, audience that's really young that's looking at us to be their role model, and um, that's really helped me change as a person. And like, yeah, like I was way more emotional. I was kind of a jerk before, and I think I'm just more calm now. Like, dude, as you get older small like issues become a lot smaller like little small things don't bother you as much anymore you know like uh you just kind of grow up so i think that's like the biggest difference now okay right i've noticed that tsm as a team has this interesting quality about it which reminds me of people like floyd mayweather for example like you know famously people say that it's not just that floyd mayweather wins that people want to see him fight half the people want to see him fight because they really want to see him lose like he talks so much shit you know and so you know it's like but that's kind of genius because as a result he's captured the whole market you know everyone wants to see him fight right in a similar fashion right C9's been in loads of finals. They've won some of them. They've lost some of them. Cloud9 can be hyped up and they can fail. But you know what? No one really goes too crazy when they fail. They go, oh, it's a shame, you know, whatever. But TSM can only either win. And if you don't win, everyone just goes mental and they're shit and they're super hot. Why do you think they, you, why does TSM provoke such a strong reaction from everyone? Is it conscious? Did you design things this way? Honestly, it's just from a pure mentality perspective, right? I'm not here to win another NALCS finals. I'm not here to take second. I feel like absolute shit when we take second in NALCS. I feel like absolute garbage when we lose internationally. And I really feel like if I'm not improving myself every single day, if I'm not getting better results year after year, then I feel like I've failed myself. And I've constantly failed myself. And that's just our mentality as an organization and me as a person is I, I, I want more. I'm I'm greedy in the sense where I just want to constantly be better at what I what I love to do. You know, obviously, like I think everyone feels the same uh, about that, but I just feel really strongly about that to an extent where it, it feels really bad. I feel really bad personally when I'm not improving uh, at what I care about, and so like when we have like bad results, it affects me a lot, like internally. 
And um, and I think that's that's really echoed to our audience, right? Is that like I, I see the same thing? Is that like uh, if like if we lose to Golden Guardians, like it's it's a huge joke because I actually feel that way. Like I want to, uh, like my goals are really high. I have really high expectations for our team, our players, myself, and I think our fans do too. And 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 because we say it and we vocalize it, people hold us to the standards, right? Yeah. Uh, versus other teams, they um, they are. They're more about like I'm gonna try our best, and it is what it is. Like, as much as I want to say that, like, uh, and, and it's a much safer approach, and you won't get shit on, and when you lose, you don't feel as bad. Sure. That that's just not how I feel. And so TSM's really how I built TSM is I built it based off of my emotion, like how I felt at that time. Like, uh, obviously, it's a lot more controlled now. <laughs> it's a lot more controlled now, sure. and, and I try to balance it better. But still, our mission is to do. To, to do better every year. Like, uh, I, I do want to get to the point where we do well internationally. Okay. At the end of the interview, do you have a final message or something you want to thank or say hello to? Um, well, I mean, like, it's it's the same generic thing that everyone would say, right? It's like, I, I want to thank my family, first of all, for really supporting me uh, and helping me get to where I'm at, first and foremost. My family, my friends, everyone around me, really. Um, uh, that's really helped me through this process. Our players, our our, our staff, our, our fans, sponsors, every everyone. Uh, it's it's been a long journey, you know. Uh, and I think that we're just getting started with this franchising. Esports is kind of crazy right now. You don't really know like what's what's happening, but it's sure. it's just super exciting overall. It feels like I'm doing a new job every single day, and I'm, I go and every single day I'm super excited because it's like a new challenge. It's not like I don't go to my job and I'm like, oh, I have to work nine to five and do the same shit over and over. I go to my job, I'm like, what's next? What's new? This is so cool. Things are always changing. And if anything, I feel super lucky that I, I, I'm in this uh, position. And like, you know, my online persona is like kind of cocky and arrogant, but like behind the scenes, we treat it like it's day one. And, you know, uh, it's freaking super exciting. I'm super excited to start this year. This is LS and you're on Thorne's YouTube channel. So cut the Western shit.